you would open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 7. We continue our study in the book of, in the gospel of Matthew, and we will finish uh, looking at the, the Sermon on the Mount this morning. Uh, before we jump into that, uh, it is Palm Sunday. If you are, uh, grew up in a more liturgical background, you'll know that even a Baptist like myself knows today is Palm Sunday. Good Friday on Friday and Easter Sunday uh, is the height of Christians uh, celebrating uh, kind of a festival in, in memory of Christ's resurrection. And so uh, I want to begin by kind of fast forwarding a little bit into the gospel to John chapter 12, where we read in the first verse that six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus died whom Jesus had raised from the dead. And while he's in this little town of Bethany, outside of Jerusalem, he has dinner where Mary, Lazarus' sister, uh, anoints him, anoints his feet. They have a discussion just on the fiscal responsibility of this act, and uh, that doesn't go well for Judas, as we find out later on in the passage. Uh, And then in verse 9, the narrative picks up, Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. That's the second time that John mentions Lazarus. It's not the last time. But this raising up of Lazarus is quite important. In fact, in verse 10, it says, so the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well. So it was not just that there were many people who were interested in Lazarus' resurrection, but those who associated it with the gaining of power and authority that Jesus had. And we see these religious leaders who rejected Christ's authority and wanted to get rid of him, and now Lazarus got wrapped up into that. It says in verse 12 that the next day the great crowd gathered uh, that had come out for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. So they took palm branches and went out to meet him shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, blessed is the King of Israel. Then Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, as it is written, Do not be afraid, daughter Zion, see your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. At first his disciples did not understand all of this, only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that these things had been done to him. Now the crowd That was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead, continued to spread the word. In fact, it says in verse 18 that many people, because they had heard that he had performed this sign, meaning raising Lazarus from the dead, went out to meet him. So the Pharisees said to one another, see, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. And so we find on Palm Sunday this celebration of that week prior to the Passover festival and to Jesus' death and resurrection. There is, uh, things are going quite well for Christ and His ministry. In fact, if you were the disciples, you probably would have thought things are going great. Everyone believes He's the King. We believe He's the King. Let's get this kingdom started. When we Fast forward a little bit further, John 19, by the time we get to the end of this week, we find that Pilate, this pagan Roman who is stuck in Jerusalem, brings Jesus out having flogged him and putting a crown of thorns on his head and mocked him, and he comes out with this verdict that he does not see Jesus as any kind of a political threat to Rome. In other words, this charge which is brought before him that he was going to have everybody follow him and that he was going to set up a kingdom to rival Rome that Pilate did not see uh, that Jesus had managed to raise any kind of an army. Truth be told, his best friends had deserted him. He was there by himself. The religious leaders hated him and seemed to want to kill him, and so he would have just let him go. But we find that the religious leaders worked the crowd into a frenzy, to the point that they chose a different person, Barabbas, to go free, and they allowed Jesus and demanded his crucifixion for breaking the Old Testament law claiming to be the Son of God. 
And so we see this pathway of Jesus coming into Jerusalem with great throngs and people's excitement and the, and the weekends with him by himself carrying a cross, being executed. This is a, a challenging turn of events, particularly for those who would call themselves the disciples and confusing. And I like how it says that they didn't even realize how God's word was coming fulfilled as it was happening. It wasn't until after his ascension that they realized that the kingdom of God is different than what they imagined it to be, and probably quite a bit better than what they could imagine it to be. But the truth of the matter is, is that Jesus was, in fact, the king. That he told Pontius Pilate, I am a king. He, the religious leaders understood something, but he was not going to share his rule with them. And so we celebrate on Easter next week the resurrection of the king. And uh, that will bring us back to Matthew chapter 7, where we see Jesus giving what is often called the Sermon on the Mount. It's more typical if I were the person writing the special little notes on what passages is called. I think I would call this the Sermon of Two Kingdoms, because Jesus here is describing the kingdom of earth and the kingdom of heaven, and what His reign in the kingdom of heaven looks like. And so we come to the end of that sermon today. And before we do, let's just pause for a moment and and ask the Lord's help. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you have laid before us your word, your eternal truth, and I ask that you would take our hearts and our minds and mold them in your likeness, that we would uh, come to a deeper abiding faith in your name. Amen. As a point of review, Jesus is the king of this heavenly kingdom, and his desire is for us to be those who dwell with him in righteousness. And so a few weeks ago, we look at the Lord's Prayer, that Jesus is teaching us that in God's kingdom, you and I live under the rule and reign of the God who created us. That God will undo the fallenness of this world. In the meantime, we live in this fallen world. So having been belonging to God's kingdom, how do we engage, for example, with the fallen world? The fact that we see hunger and nakedness and all this other problem in the world And Jesus points us to the providence of God, that God will provide for his people. And we looked at that doctrine a couple weeks ago, the doctrine of God's providence. Last week, we looked at how do we relate to one another, fallen creatures. So it's not just that we live in a fallen world, but we live as fallen people with fallen people, which pointed us to God's mercy, the doctrine of God's great mercy towards his people. And now we see in verse 13 that Jesus kind of concludes by saying, enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the road, which leads to the kingdom of destruction. But small is the gate and narrow is the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Several years ago, when I was just out of high school, I had uh, come back to, yeah, it was a few years ago, not that long, 96 96, the late 90s, you remember those? And uh, I went to community college at Skagit Valley, Skagit Valley Community College, and I took a class. I was somewhat interested in pursuing teaching and ministry, and so I took a class that was of great interest to me called Philosophy of Religion. It was a young teacher. She was uh, full of life, and, and she was a pretty good teacher, but she had just returned from India. She had spent time in India where she had converted to Hinduism. And so she was a Hindu, uh, but born in, in the West and a convert. And so she, we, most of the, the, the class that we did was kind of looking at and comparing all different world religions, and essentially on how they're all very similar to one another. This is a common theme, I think, in, in academia today, is this idea that all people are basically religious and very similar. We just read last week, we ended in verse 12 of Matthew 7 of the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And so she kind of gave us this image, which was the foundation of the class, which is that all religions are kind of like people on on a mountain. And and the theme or or the image of God being in the heavens is is that God resides at the top of the mountain in, in the ancient world, certainly. Uh, The Greeks 
followed this with Mount Olympus, where Zeus ruled over all the people. And that essentially all religion is, is people working their way up the mountain. Now, the those who are involved with Islam, they're kind of on this side of the mountain. They're working their way, and the Hindus are over here. They have all their different gods, and they're trying to basically do the same thing, not kill each other, love their neighbor, you know, do good, and they're working their way up this way, and the Christians are over here in the West doing this, and the Buddhists over in the East are doing this, and we're all kind of doing different things and following different paths, but basically we're all trying our best to get towards and come towards God. And at the end of all things, we all kind of come to that same place at the very top. That was the the theme of the class. And I've often thought about that, and when I was reading this this week, it, it seems to me that Jesus seems to paint a different picture, that he kind of inverts this mountain that I think would be a common way that we think about religion today. In fact, I think this is a criticism of religion in general, that Jesus is highly critical of the religious in this ending section, which is why I think it ends with him kind of in a juxtaposition with who? The religious leaders, that Jesus was something different. Uh, I've mentioned several times that uh, I once hiked to the bottom of the Grand Canyon, a great feat uh, that I'm very, very, very proud of. Uh, We did it in the middle of August when it was a thousand degrees at the bottom of the canyon. (laughs) There was only a tiny little stream where there was a little tiny little bit of life at the very bottom of this canyon, and it was filled with tourists who had made a terrible mistake. (laughs) Ah, And off to the right was this emaciated deer and huddled in this little, under this tree. I remember looking at it, and its tongue was hanging out, and it was just panting for the water, but it couldn't get there because of all the, the big tourists who were lounging in it. And then And I've never been able to sing as a deer pants for the water without thinking of that little buddy. Um, I often wonder, is that how my heart pants after God and his word? Am I thirsty? But this, when you go to the Grand Canyon, what they tell you is to be very careful. It's very easy to get to the bottom, and it's very hard to get out. And most people, when we hike a mountain, you do all the hard work at first, and then the next day, it's easy coming down. But it's, it, it's reversed. It is a broad road that goes to the bottom, and it is a narrow road which comes out. And it's best if you have a donkey, uh, <laughs> is what I found out. I think that Jesus is actually saying that the commonality that we have religiously in the world is that we are religious people because we all came from the top of the mountain. We're all created in God's image. We all have this shadow of the holy that resides in the heart of human kind. But we have all wandered down this mountain. We are all actually moving away from God, that our pride causes us to move away from God, and we're going in all manners of different directions, so that all religion is is this moving away from the holiness of God and dwelling on self-righteousness, making a way for ourselves, seeking a, a, a kind of salvation in which I am the Savior. I am the one who will save myself through all kinds of means, whether it's good works or meditation or this or that. That this is the image that Jesus presents is that broad is the road, easy is the path down away from God. And the vast majority of people are are pursuing it. But narrow is the road that leads up. Difficult it is. And yet, I believe that God is saving people all around that mountain. He's saving people out of Buddhism through the narrow gate. He's saving people out of Islam today as the gospel is preached in the Middle East. He's saving people from paganism and tribal, you know, paganism and heathenism all around the globe. And I would dare to say that even today, Christ is saving people out of the church, out of our religious bents. Jesus is saving us. And so Jesus here says, enter through the narrow gate. What is this narrow gate? I think a good illustration uh, comes out of Acts chapter 
4. And actually in Acts chapter 3, we start off with the story of Peter and John. When I was a kid, we sang a song, Peter and John went to pray. They met a lame man on the way. He held out his palm and asked them for alms, and this is what Peter did say. Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. This was a really old song. In the name, of, I don't know, from like the 1800s, I guess. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And so this lame man gets up and walks, and it creates quite a stir in Jerusalem to the point that the religious leaders, just as they had tried Jesus, so they now try Peter and John, and they bring him in, and they say, you're leading people away from our religion. And let's pick it up in Acts chapter 4, verse 8, where it says that Peter, and, and we should not neglect the importance of this, who is filled with the Holy Spirit, says to them, rulers and elders of the people, this is a, a high regard for their position. They are the rulers and the elders. They sit in the position of power in the earthly kingdoms. He says, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who is lame and are being asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus the Messiah, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone the builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Verse 12 says this, and this is what Peter has to say to those religious people. It is what he has to say to us today. Salvation is found in no one else. There is no other name under heaven which is given to men by which we can be saved. There is no other authority, no other leader, no other one with the power to do it. In fact, we see that Peter clearly says that the only thing we did was kill the Savior. But it is God who does the saving, who raised Jesus from the dead. And the great sin that is committed is the rejection of the stone. Rejection of the one who can save. Now in verse 13, it says, When they saw the courage of Peter and John, they stood with great poise and confidence. And they realized something about them. And this is what was noted about Peter and John. They were unschooled, ordinary men. They were astonished and they took note of that what was different about these men from just your common nobodies was that they had been with Jesus. And I love in verse 14 how it kind of, we'll just kind of tie a bow on it, that the thing which got them off the hook was fruit. It was the fruitfulness that this man was standing there who used to be lame, and now he was kind of, I imagine him antsy, like, what are we doing here? Let's go for a hike. You know, he was probably like, the last thing I want to do is stand around in a courtroom. But he had been drug in there, and he's like, let's go. I want to go walk. I want to go be free. Jesus says, watch out. Watch out for false prophets. We might say, watch out for religious leaders that look good on the outside, but lead people away from Christ. Lead people into some kind of religion in which they save themselves. There is a fruitfulness that comes from knowing Christ. It is the fruitfulness of being filled with the Holy Spirit. And he says, just give teachers time. Watch out for false teachers. They might look good on the outside. They're very religious, but there is no change that is happening inside. You see that pride produces terrible things and humility, good things. Jesus says, just as a fruit will produce a particular, or a tree will particular the fruit that it is made for, so also the human being 
who is filled with pride will produce destruction, and those filled with humility who come to Christ, who come to the narrow gate, will produce that which is good fruit. And they're not kind of esoteric things, they are practical things like love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and self-control. In fact, there is a further warning Jesus gives us in verse 21 where he says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoer. I don't know if you've ever read this passage with it at the deep kind of fear. Anybody ever have the doubts about their own life? I think, well, if the people who preach and the people who perform miracles and the people who exercise demons can't get in, then what about me? How assured can I be about my religion? And I would say to you, you shouldn't be assured about your religion. It's the very point that Jesus is trying to make here. What Peter and John were crystal clear on is that what saved them was that they were with Jesus. All of their assurance came from what Christ did. That's why Paul you know, talks about being one who preaches in 1 Corinthians 9. And he says, you know, everybody is running the race, and you run the race in order to win the prize, which, is, which we'll speak to in a little bit, which is, which is heaven itself. And he says, the reason I run and suffer is because I don't want to be disqualified, having preached the good news to everyone else but not received it myself. And so Jesus says, therefore, do what? Everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man. I think this is a, a, a difficult passage and one that we need to maybe dwell on with some thoughtfulness. The word there, put them into practice, is not my favorite rendition in the NIV. I kind of like the King James, which says, doeth, those who hear my word and doeth. But that word is really a word that can be translated both to do something or to make something. But it, 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 it involves something deeper than just simply practicing a religion. And and my fearfulness in this is that it's the same issue that we run into when James brings up faith and works in his letter, is that we hear him say, well, you know, you say you have faith, and and, uh, and I'll show you my faith by my works, as though works and faith are in juxtaposition. And that's not really what James is saying. He is not trying to say, well, okay, we have to not only believe but do right? It's the combination of believing and doing. And all James is saying is this, that those who believe in Christ and have His Spirit produce fruit, and that your assurance is not in the fruit. It's in the one who produces the fruit in your life. And so, therefore, everyone who hears the Word and puts them into practice is like what? is like a builder who digs down and finds a good foundation, a rock. What is that rock? What is that thing which gives us assurance, which holds us up? What is that thing which holds up Noah in the time when destruction came on the world and yet yet held him up, buoyed him? What is this ark? What is this stone that the builders rejected? It's Christ. In fact, We actually see this in Luke uh, chapter 9, where Jesus is asking the disciples, who do people say that I am? And we know that Peter answers that you are God's Messiah, that you are the Anointed One, that you are the Christ. And in verse 21, Jesus strictly warns them not to tell anyone. Why? Well, because they didn't really understand it. They didn't really understand what this meant, and they wouldn't really understand the kingdom of God until after the resurrection. And he goes on to say, 
that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and he must be killed and on the third day raised to life. And then he looks at them and says, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet forfeit their very soul? When Jesus commends us to building our life on something which is the rock, it is that we would put our faith in Jesus Christ and His work. We don't have to go around and say, well, you know what? And this is, I think, one of the dangers is, is this idea of, well, I believe, and, and by saying the words of Jesus, or, you know, I said a sinner's prayer, or I did something, in the past, that's sufficient. Uh, or I'm a part, part of a church that is, you know, believes in Jesus and has good theology, and that's sufficient enough. That's not what Jesus is saying here. In fact, it's on the heels of him saying, you can go to one where you see miracles happening that sings great praise music. The real question in your heart is, do you love Christ, the person himself? Not just his teaching, not just his religion, but him. This is always the question for every believer. It is why there are many who go to church and attend and are very religious, have a very high view of their moral self, but they have not encountered their sin and what Jesus Christ has done to save them. And so Jesus actually tells us that you and I must take up our cross daily. What does he mean? He means this, that those who build their life on faith in Jesus Christ, the rock, the one who does the work, those who understand what Paul writes to the church in Ephesus, it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this not of yourself. It is the gift of God, not by works. Because what is your great danger? What is the thing which drags us down the mountain, down the broad street into destruction? It's pride, so that no one can boast. So what happens? Well, the rains come down. What happened to Jesus? Well, on, on Palm Sunday, things were great. What was raining down on him was praise and adoration and large crowds, a big parade. But we find that by the end of the week, that big parade had turned into a one-man show, walking in the worst kind of suffering that would end in death itself. So that Peter says to the church, that our salvation, grounded in faith in Jesus Christ, is a beautiful thing. And how is the fruit exposed? How is faith exposed? Well, he says that though we rejoice, and we do have great reason to rejoice for God's free gift of salvation, but now for a little while in this world we have to suffer. All kinds of trials. And the reason that the rain comes down and that we suffer, and that the streams rise, is that the genuineness of our faith, which is greater worth than gold, is proven to be true. Because all our circumstances cannot change the relationship that we have with Christ. We can fake a relationship with Christ, but I guarantee you, most people, when they encounter great suffering, they'll one, a couple things will oftentimes happen. For those who are religious, they will simply be angry at God because the way in which they were being saved is, I follow your rules, and then you bless me. And so when I'm not blessed, when suffering comes, then you broke the bargain. I should be getting something. I should earn something for this. This is the way all religions work. I do this thing which appeases the gods and then I get something 
good in return. And so pride is, is excited and in us, and we go down the broad road of religion. But the other thing that can happen is we recognize something, that God's grace is free. That actually I deserve punishment and separation from God because of my sin. And yet Jesus Christ has welcomed me, has saved me, has promised me a kingdom. And so I enter that suffering and that difficulty with a confidence that Jesus Christ both raised Lazarus from the dead, was himself by God raised from the dead, and that I have a future kingdom that far outweighs any of the suffering today. And so then my faith and my trust is built up according to Peter. And all of this is founded not in anything we do, but in a relationship that we have. Verse 8, though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him. You trust in him. You believe that what he says is true. You believe that you are the sinner that he calls you and that you are the saint that he makes you by the blood that was shed for you. You allow that work of the Holy Spirit to be in you so that it humbles you and it actually produces fruit. And that fruit does not make you proud. Rather, it continues to point you back to the grace of God and how much greater He is. Which is why real gospel teaching will always raise up the name of Jesus. And remember that you and I are ordinary people. And the best thing that we could ever say about us is that we were with Christ. That we responded to His grace. That when we get up in the morning, that it is He who is the first on our minds. And when we go to bed at night, He's the last who we speak to. He rules over our hearts through His Holy Spirit. He makes us penitent. If you find sin in your life, it might cause you to doubt, am I really a believer? But it's not the sin which should cause you to be assured or not assured of your salvation. It is the fact that Jesus has forgiven it again and will forgive it tomorrow. And if you can hold on to that, you will have real assurance. And you will also see that you won't have to talk about your faith, that it will produce the kind of life that reflects God's goodness. Jesus is different. I want to just close with a, with a thought on uh, kind of an illustration for us to think about. Uh, John Bunyan famously wrote uh, Pilgrim's Progress, probably one of the, the greatest selling books of all time. And in it, Christian, who's the main character, has uh, been given salvation. He has come through the narrow gate. It's called the wicked gate. And he comes through this little gate where he finds that Jesus is willing to take off the burden of sin, which, which weights him down, put clothes of righteousness on him, gives him a a parchment, which is the word of God in his hand, and now sets him on this journey between his salvation and the celestial city, this resurrected kingdom. And on the way, he's walking down this path, and these two guys join him, both of them dressed like him, uh, but one is named formalist and the other hypocrisy. They represent those who are in the church, who follow the religion of Christianity and believe that it is in their following the religion that makes them acceptable to God. And so Christian challenges them. He says, wait, you didn't come through the narrow gate. You didn't come to this place by faith in what Christ has done for you, but rather in your own works. And they said, what's the difference? We end up at the same place. How we got here, we're on the same road. And to some degree, Christian at that point goes, I, don't, I, I guess I don't know. Like, I, you know, I, we're all going that same direction. You guys are going your way. I'll go my way. Until they reach a hill, which is called the hill difficulty. And, and I'll just read a little section. He says, I behold, held then that they all went on until they came to the foot of the hill difficulty. This is the rain that Jesus is speaking about in his parable. 
at the bottom of which was a spring. There were also in the same place two other ways beside that which came straight from the gate. One turned to the left hand and the other to the right hand at the bottom of the hill. But the narrow way led right up the hill, and the name of the going up side of the hill is called difficulty. And what's described then is that the two men, formalists and hypocrisy, they both look at the situation and they say, let's take the easy path. Let's take the broad road. It goes around the hill and we'll get to the other side the same way. This is the situation for many who are very religious. They look to God like the people on the day, on Palm Sunday, and they say, you're the king. We want to follow you. You're going to make life better for us. But to follow Christ is to follow Him up a difficult hill, a hill which involves suffering. And we're told that in Bunyan's story that Christian looks both ways and he decides, I'd rather stay true to the path. I'd rather go up the hill of difficulty now and get to where I'm going. And formalists and hypocrisy, they go the other ways and they fall into this, they get lost in this woods and this other one falls into this pit and, and they both come to ruin. And the conclusion that Christian reached, he says, is shall they who wrong begin yet rightly end? Or they that, <clears throat> sorry, shall they who wrong begin yet rightly end? Shall they at all have safety for their friend? No, no. In headstrong manner they set out, and headlong will they fall at last, no doubt. Our assurance does not come in the path that we are on. It comes in the way in which we get here, that we've entered through the narrow gate. By faith in Jesus Christ, we have confidence that we will reach the end. Though it involves difficulty, though it involves a challenge, moving uphill, following Christ, taking up our cross daily, If we have come to this place by faith in Jesus Christ, then we will enter the resurrection in that same way. Jesus is different. He's different from the religious leaders. He's different from any religious leaders in the world. And so we're called to put our trust in Him today. And I would just assure you that if you have asked Him for your forgiveness of your sins, if you've humbled yourself before Him, then you have absolute assurance that when you die, you will be welcomed in. But if you are going your own way, if your life is about you, and you pay little attention to the rock, and it's on the basis of your own works and your own goodness and your own righteousness, then there is a warning here that Jesus gives us graciously and kindly to turn from that, to humble yourself, and allow yourself to come before Christ and receive freely His grace today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank You for Your Word this morning. I pray that each and every one of us would feel a a deep assurance of that love. I pray for a spirit, Lord, of humility to come before You each day and to recognize our need for You. I pray that You would, through Your Holy Spirit, draw us close to You. Um, Continue to make us your people. In your name, amen.